Hey, what's up everybody? Thanks for tuning in today. My name is Tyler Dowdy and I'm going to talk to you about fermentation. Uh, fermentation is a multi-billion dollar industry that's still growing. There's a lot of jobs here. That's the reason why students might find this video because you might be taking a course to learn this. Uh, you might have also seen it in a job description or maybe you're just interested in where some of your products come from. All of those things and more will be in this video. I hope you enjoy it, but in order to get into it, let's get my face off of the screen here uh, and let's go over and check out what a lab scale fermenter looks like. So I wanna show you a kind of scary looking fermenter to begin with, lots of things coming off of this, lots of tubes, lots of clamps. It's really intimidating if I'm honest about it. Uh, but as we go through this video, we're gonna see what these parts and pieces do and try to understand the logic. Before we can actually dissect a fermenter like this, we need to ask the question, why do we need it? Uh, knowing the why is really going to help us understand the how. So let's start off here with the why. That's going to be a couple of PowerPoint slides. After that, we're going to go into the lab and we're going to build a fermenter uh, piece by piece and talk about the parts and the concepts involved. Uh, and then after that, we'll show fermenters in action. Uh, you'll be able to see how these pieces synergize together to create a working lab scale fermenter. Just want to quickly mention that this is our first video, and you can follow us on Twitter at Relentless Biotech. Give me some comments and feedback of how to make this better. I'm sure it's not going to be a perfect video. Uh, SysBio is where I work, and Chassis is part of where my funding comes from, so you can check out those sites. Lots of cool biology on each of those links. But for now, let's talk about fermentation for production. So... If you want to produce a product, you might use an industrial scale fermenter that might look like this image I'm showing you. Uh, these things can get bigger than this, but what I want to show this for is to show you how complicated it looks. Again, lots of tubes, lots of pipes, looks pretty intimidating, but the concept is pretty simple. We want to take media, which is rather inexpensive. It might contain glucose, for example, here. It might contain vitamins and other nutrients, uh, and we want to put in a microbe all of these things are relatively inexpensive. We want to go through the process of fermentation and we want to get out something high value. And uh, for this presentation, we'll talk about insulin, but this doesn't have to be insulin. This is how we make a lot of the ethanol that goes into your gasoline. This is how we make a lot of fragrances, supplements, etc. cetera. Uh, but today we'll talk about insulin because it's a simple product to think about. So in 1922, uh, scientists and doctors figured out that insulin was uh, the problem for type 1 diabetics, insulin production. And from that point forward, for about 60 years, uh, people were purifying insulin from the pancreas of pigs and cows. And that insulin extended the lives and the quality of life of people with type 1 diabetes, but it was a little bit imperfect. Uh, you know, pig insulin is not exactly identical to human insulin. It's very close, but it's not identical. Uh, when you purify something from an animal, you could get some contaminants coming along with it. You might get something like an antibody contaminating your insulin batch, which could cause problems for your patients. Uh, so it's a bit annoying in that sense. And I think another big thing is that uh, supply was having trouble keeping up with demand because you don't get that much insulin from a, a single pig. Uh, in 1982, the first microbial produced insulin came to market, and it was actually human insulin. Uh, so you're taking now media and a microbe, and you're making a better, more pure product uh, for less of a cost. And that concept in general allowed the supply to meet the demand and for patients to have uh, better outcomes. This uh, is now a $7 billion industry making insulin. Uh, and the only reason I put that is that there's jobs here. This is, this is a lot of engineering, a lot of science, and a lot of hard work to get this to happen. Now, whether we're making insulin or something else, it always starts with a basic understanding of biology. And this is also something that many, many scientists will spend entire careers on doing this work. Uh, and it really facilitates our ability uh, to make products. Uh, after we understand how something is made, for example, insulin, how it's made in the pancreas, we will use synthetic biology to get microbes to make insulin. Microbes don't make insulin to begin with. We have to basically teach them. That's a simplified way to think about it. Uh, we then want to prove the concept that the microbes are actually making some insulin. And then we want to use lab scale fermentation to try to perfect this process as best we can. 
Uh, we want to do all of this before our industrial scale fermentation because running a reactor like this and having a facility that runs reactors like this is incredibly expensive. So if you want to uh, get a company or investors to fund this, you really have to do all of these four steps to prove to them that your idea is really viable. So when you see something crazy and scary like this, just know that it's all for a purpose. It's all so that we can create insulin uh, at high quality and high levels. So, okay, why do we use fermenters? We really haven't answered that question yet. Uh, let's think about an analogy first. Let's say you want to paint your lab. You're going to hire a crew to do that, and they will do the work. But they'll do the work better if you have a nice ventilated area, if you provide them some water and food, and if you provide them the right temperature and environment. If all of those things are right, you can, inspect, you can expect to get really high production out of your painting crew. Now, the analogy would be if we want to make insulin, we take our microbes and our media. Uh, if we don't give them the right atmosphere, like oxygenation, the right pH, and the right temperature, then we won't get as good of production. So to increase production, we want to control all of these variables and more uh, in our fermentation reaction. So... Here's what a lab scale fermenter is going to look like. Uh, it is about a one liter working volume or maybe half a liter working volume instead of that giant fermenter that we saw on the previous page. We're going to use this to improve the efficiency of production in our organism. So if we're still thinking about insulin, we have to improve the efficiency to a point where the work that goes into making insulin is more is less expensive than the value of the product we're getting out. So we have to improve the efficiency. Uh, we also want to isolate variables in the fermenter. Maybe we think that uh, a little bit of a change in pH can increase production. We want to isolate that variable and only have the pH change. Or maybe we only want to try the same production at a different temperature. Uh, so all of these things will work together in a fermenter, and they will allow us to assess if we're actually going to be able to produce a molecule of interest uh, for a viable price. So let's step into the lab. We're going to build a fermenter from the ground up, piece by piece, and explain each part as we go. Uh, and then we'll see the fermenter in action. All right, so before we get into fermentation room where things are going to look really complicated, let's build up a fermenter uh, so that we can see what the working parts are going to look like. Uh, first, we'll start off with a vessel. So this is a 500 ml working volume vessel. I put some water in there uh, so that we can see how it's going to look. Uh, you can get bigger or smaller vessels at lab scale, but this should give us a general principle of how this works. So the concept is that we're going to combine that vessel with this crazy looking cap unit, which is going to allow us to control a lot of variables that we can't control in a shake flask. So the first thing to look at here is stirring. So stirring is going to be accomplished by this impeller. This is going to sit below the surface of the liquid and keep the reactor stirred. It will stop the cells from settling and it will also keep the aeration uh, even throughout the chamber. Uh, that's going to be stirred via a motor, which is going to spin this top piece, spinning the impeller. Motor is not so complicated looking, just looks like this. Uh, we're going to plug a cord in here at the top. It will sit on the top of the fermenter itself, and it will spin the impeller. Uh, a computer will control the speed. So nothing too complicated there. So we have stirring. The next thing is to look at aeration. Aeration is going to be accomplished via sending air down through this. This is called the sparger. At the bottom of this, there are air holes, which are going to allow uh, air to be pushed out toward the bottom of the vessel. So the air will actually be going out toward the bottom, and it will bubble up from there. Uh, that's going to be pumped in through this tube at the top, which will, I'm sorry, this tube at the top, which will go down through our sparger uh, and allow us to aerate our chamber. And it, along with the impeller, that's going to give us a nice, even aeration throughout our entire chamber. Uh, the next thing to take a look at is the sampling port. So if we want to be able to take samples while this reaction is going on, we need one port to be below the surface of the liquid. Uh, and what we can do is actually pop a syringe on here and use the negative pressure from a syringe to pull some of the media out of our solution. We're going to want to track what's happening in our reaction at the level of our cells, and this is how we do it, by pulling some cells in the media 
uh, out into a syringe, which we can then measure via various assays. You're also going to see another port here. This is just a thermometer port. So we're going to use a computer and a digital thermometer to measure the temperature throughout the reaction to make sure that we keep the heating at a very precise temperature. So we're going to control heat, we're going to control aeration, and we're going to control stirring, all, all via our computer. All right, and we're back. So the scene looks a little bit more complicated than it did a moment ago. What I'll first ask you to do is disregard this graph on the left. We'll fill that in in just a moment. First, let's focus on the fermenter on the right. So this is the fermenter with all of the same parts that you saw previously. Uh, just now I've labeled where the air is gonna go in so that these tubes are a little bit out of the way. Then also where air is going to come out. And this is a good time to talk about fermentation in general which is that we're going to pump air in at a specific speed, at a specific rate, and we're going to know the composition of that air going in. So we're gonna have a machine that is measuring the, the composition and the speed of the air that we're pumping in. We're gonna control that by a computer, and it's going to, again, come down through the sparger, uh, pushing air toward the bottom of the reactor, which will bubble upwards. Our stirrer, our impeller, will keep it all stirred evenly. What we didn't talk about so much before is the air coming out of the reactor. So not only do we need to let air out because it is going to be an airtight system when we're done constructing it, but we also want to measure that air coming out. So we want to measure the speed to make sure that we're not losing and leaking air out of anywhere. But we also want to know the composition of that air. Because if, for instance, a yeast that is burning a sugar like glucose, uh, we can actually know a lot about what's happening uh, during that fermentation by tracing the, the molecular composition of the air coming out. So if the CO2 level is starting to rise, we can deduce some things uh, to the cells inside of what would be media right here. Okay, so you have those two concepts. You know that we're gonna be tracing the air going in. I did wanna show you quickly the sampling. Uh, I talked to you about this before, but I just wanted to show you what it might look like. So we can hook up a syringe here. Again, this goes down below the level of our media. Uh, and that allows us to draw media from the vessel itself. You may not be able to see that water, but uh, it is truly there. So what we would do with this media and cells in a real reaction is we would trace what metabolites were in the media at that moment, what metabolites were inside of the cell at that moment, what RNAs or proteins were inside of the cells in that reaction. And from all of that, we can learn more about our process uh, and we may be able to make it more efficient uh, and get a, get a lot of information from that. The other two tubes you're seeing here are acid and base tubes. So for instance, we could call this our acid tube. What we would do is hook a, uh, a line up to this. You'll see that in a few moments. And that would allow us to slowly add in acid. If the uh, media starts to become too basic, we can add in a very small drop of acid to, ra uh, to lower the pH back to the level that we want. The same thing is true if with the tube like this, which is going to be used for base. And both of those are going to be hooked up to uh, small rotary pumps, which allow us to very accurately add a very small amount of liquid. Now, being able to add acid and base would be pointless if we don't know the actual pH of our media. So what we have is a probe that is going to measure the pH of this media. So this probe is going to sit below the surface of the water inside of this vessel. Uh, it's going to be connected on top to a cable, which is going to go to a machine and then to a computer, which will allow us to track in real time the pH of this vessel. That's going to be locked down by a gasket. Everything's locked down by a gasket so that we don't lose any air uh, through the top here. So this would be hooked in, you could imagine, through this port. Uh, and that up to the moment tracking, along with our ability to add acid and base, allows really a, a computer on its own to keep the pH of this vessel at a very constant pH. So if we look at this graph over here and we think about pH on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, we're gonna get readings up to the minute from this vessel. So maybe we get one reading every minute that tells us that our pH that we started with is starting to dip a little bit. This is becoming a little bit too acidic. What we would do is add in a drop of maybe KOH, something that is a bit basic, which would rise up the pH back to the normal level we want. Uh, and the same thing, if this pH was to get a little bit too basic, we could then just add in some acid.
So now that we know the concepts of acid and base control, let's step into the lab and look at some rotary pumps. So in this video, you can see on the left some base. On the right, we have some concentrated acid. And what you're looking at are four pumps labeled A1 to A4. You're going to see now that uh, pump A3 begins to spin. That is actually an indication that that rotary pump is pumping a little bit of acid into our reactor at that moment. And the reason we would see that is because our reactor has gotten a little bit too basic, so we add a small drop of acid to balance it out. This is a pH controlled reaction. We could also let the reaction do whatever it wants and not add acid and base at all. One last thing to mention is this, uh, this port that I showed you that we'd hook a digital thermometer to. Uh, that's gonna allow us to track the temperature this particular type of fermenter is going to be sitting in a chamber, which is going to hug it on all sides, and that's actually going to provide heating uh, to the vessel. So we'll keep the temperature constant and we'll monitor that as well. Uh, other systems might have what's called a heat finger, which basically just looks a little bit like this pH probe, but it will be metal uh, and it will heat uh, below the surface of the liquid to keep the heat constant. So all in all, this fermenter is going to allow us to control a lot of variables Again, I'm going to show you now what it looks like uh, when it's actually running. It's going to look a little bit crazy, but you can always come back to the first part of this video where we're talking about these components on the computer, or to this part of the video where we're showing them one by one. Uh, if the next step gets too complicated, you can always come back. All right, so as promised, we are now in the fermentation room, and we're looking at a running lab-scale fermentation. There are four fermenter vessels in front of you. And uh, I apologize for the shakiness here. First thing I want to point out is that pH probe we've been talking about that is sitting below the level of our media. Uh, you can see next to it, we have two tubes going in. There's one, there's the other. One is acid, one is base. We're controlling the pH of this uh, reaction using the probe and those two tubes and the pumps that we showed a moment ago. So you understand how acid and base is controlled here. Uh, the next thing to look at is where the air goes in. That's through this white tube. It goes through a little filter and down through our sparger, as we talked about before, which is released below the surface of the liquid. And as you can see from my fingers, bubbles up. Uh, that air is going to come out of the fermenter through this tube down this green line. Uh, it's going to go through another filter to make sure we don't spit out any uh, moisture. And then it's going to be analyzed in a gas analyzer. Next, you see a motor and an impeller. You can see that impeller spinning below the level of the liquid. We talked about that earlier as well. Uh, so now you can see how the aeration is going to work in here as well. Next thing to point out is the temperature probe, which is going in here. That's our digital thermometer, which is going to tell us the temperature and make sure that our reaction stays at exactly the temperature that we designed this experiment to be at. Uh, that's, again, going to be heated by this block that sits around the vessel itself. So keep that in mind. We're keeping the temperature controlled with that block. One more thing to point out here is going to be uh, this syringe that's hanging off the front. So this is where it, this fermenter was inoculated. So the experimenters put in yeast in this case, budding yeast, and they've pushed it in through this syringe at the very beginning of this reaction. Uh, this whole vessel is sterilized and then we pump in, we push in uh, our yeast to start things off. That's how it looks, the fermentation room, lots of computers, lots of equipment, lots of technology, but all of this works together to allow us to uh, control our vessel and uh, our reaction. All right, so we've gone through lab scale fermentation. We've built a fermenter from the ground up. We talked about why you would wanna do this, so let's just finish with a couple of quick conclusions. Uh, this is the same diagram from earlier where we're adding media and a microbe uh, and we're creating a product. We talked about this for insulin. Just wanted to remind you that there are a lot of uh, steps before we get to this industrial scale production. And that takes a lot of great science and a lot of great work. And if you're interested in, in any one of these steps, there are jobs there and there are careers there that can be really fruitful. So I hope that you consider not just uh, working on that final industrial scale, but maybe you want to be the person who figures out how a plant makes a certain molecule to begin with. Uh, that is a really viable job and a really great career as well. Uh, what I wanted to do at the end of this video is think about considerations for scale up. So we showed a half 
uh, 500 mil uh, fermenter. We want to scale that up to a much larger volume fermenter. We need to consider that there is a giant cost increase here. So our process needs to be bulletproof. We need to be able to track our product yields. For that, we'll use chemistry, often HPLC, to know how much of our product that we're producing uh, per, for instance, gram of sugar that we're putting in. Uh, we want to make sure that that is efficient so that the cost of our media and the cost of our process is a small fraction of the value of the product that comes out. We got to pay the people to run these machines. We have to use electricity and we have to spend money to make that media and to engineer that microbe. So at the end of it, we have to get the value out of this process for it to be viable. We also want to get proof of concept via data. So we want to look at data from every angle about what's happening inside the media of this reactor. We want to look at what's happening inside of the cells. We have a lot of really cool techniques to do that. Hopefully we'll get to that in a later video on this channel. Uh, but there is a ton of work and effort here. Uh, but eventually, if we can check all of the right boxes, we can scale up to industrial scale and we can do something good for society uh, using fermentation. So let me just show you my face here for a moment. We'll, uh, we'll call it a day on this one. Uh, lab scale fermentation, we started off with this crazy looking device. Hopefully it makes a little more sense to you. Uh, again, Relentless Biotech uh, is the channel. Give us a shout on Twitter. Uh, Sysbio is where I'm working. Chassis is a cool project from the EU, uh, the EU funded. I'm Tyler Dowdy. This is it for me. I'm signing off. Thanks for tuning in. Much love to you. I hope to see you in the next video. I hope to hear your comments on this one.